Okay, well, everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, as, the, as the topic says, uh, I'm going to talk about modeling of bipartite networks uh, from available data. Now, uh, actually, uh, the I won't actually get to the bipartite networks until pretty late in the talk. Um, uh, well, because I need to talk about the, sort of the framework in which we're going to do this and how we're going to take the data uh, and uh, make use of it and then transfer that, see how we can transfer that experience to bipartite uh, network models. Okay, so uh, first of all, a word on modeling first. Uh, when, uh, so there's sort of two main approaches and modeling is sort of in contrast to sort of a more direct approach uh, such as uh, Victoria, what Victoria Kaliza presented a while, uh, the other day, uh, where basically you reconstruct a synthetic population from the available data and then you simulate the spread over the network, right? That's sort of one empirical approach. Model-based approach, uh, it takes a different tack, right? First, we sort of abstract key features of the network. We ask, okay, which features of the network are actually important? Which mi mixing matrices, which degree distributions, there can be many of them. Uh, hopefully, they're not self-contradictory, mutually exclusive. And then we take a generative model, we estimate a generative model, a probability model for these features given the observed data. And that's that may not be straightforward, but that's what part of the talk is about. Uh, then we can simulate possible networks from the estimated model because it's generative, and then we simulate the spread over the plausible networks. And the nice thing about there that is that since we get to simulate plausible networks, we get a range of predictions. We get some idea of how uh, robust our predictions are. So, uh, ge getting generative models can be challenging. Um, the, uh, in particular, uh, one challenge is the exogenous versus endogenous effect. So. Uh, this network, uh, one might say it has an excess of triangles. That is, friend of a friend is a friend. Now, I won't get into details of how you can uh, evaluate this, but it, we can say that the relative to having no triangle effect uh, or tri friend of a friend is a friend effect, uh, this network has a lot of triangles, like 99th percentile. But it turns out that actually it's not the sort of the endogenous friend of a friend is a friend effect, turns out that actually there are groups in this network and there's homophily within groups. And after you control for that, it turns out that uh, all those triangles are very well accounted for. In fact, it's pretty typical, right? So exogenous effects versus endogenous effects. And we need to be able to do both. Um, so we're going to do both in the statistical framework called ERGAM. Now, Sam Jeunesse uh, talked a bit about it uh, in his talk, uh, but I'll elaborate on some aspects of it. Uh, so how do we model a network in general, right? If you have these binary relations, yeah, tie, no tie, right? Well, we have to write down a model for the ties, right? For the ties, but we also have to write down the model for the non-ties or any ties that could possibly happen because there's information in that as well, right? So we write down the model and it makes sense to use something like a logistic regression, right? So where I say logic of the probability of a tie between I and J, uh, we might, is some theta one parameter, which you know, might be the intercept or the overall density, uh, plus theta two times, and maybe they, for this particular network, we'll say an indicator of whether I and J are in the same group, right? They're both blue or they're both red or they're both green, right? Uh, so that makes sense. That's pretty straightforward uh, for exogenous effects, but then we have endogenous effects. And there, well, maybe we want to model the effects of, you know, having a friend of a friend be a friend, having a friend of, of a friend, right? And we might model that by, by counting the number of triangles formed by I and J in some third party K, right? But now we have a problem because now we have a network on the left-hand side and we have a network on the right-hand side, right? So it's kind of autoregressive almost. And uh, so the idea behind ERGAMS, ERGAMS resolve this by saying that let's write down the regression in terms of summary statistics. So we have our theta one, which we want to use to model overall tendency to have ties. So let's have a statistic, a summary statistic, total number of ties in the network. And maybe theta two, we remember that was representing the tendency to have homophilus ties. So let's count the ties within groups. And for triangles, uh, we want to use that to model the tendency of a friend or a friend to be a friend. So let's count the number of triangles in the network. Um, now, uh, as a very brief note aside, normally I'm using triangles illustratively because everybody knows what a triangle looks like. Uh, in the ordinary course of things, we actually wouldn't use it to model these types of effects for a variety of reasons that I can elaborate on if you'd like, but are outside the scope of this talk. 
okay, so given that we write down a model. Uh, now, wh whereas before we only wrote it down for one tile at a time, now we're writing it down for the whole network at once, right? And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, we, spe we specify this model in terms of the statistics of the network, sufficient, uh, we call them sufficient statistics. They are functions of the network and maybe some actor attributes, right? Um, and then we parameterize it by a vector theta of model parameters. And then we take a dot product, which is basically we take each element of theta and multiply it by the corresponding element of G. So each G represents some summary statistic of the network and we multiply it by its corresponding theta and then we add them all up, right? And then uh, we exponentiate the result and divide it by the normalizing constant, which is often intractable, which is why we end up using MCMC to uh, simulate and estimate these models. Um, the, the, this is a, again, that's a whole separate talk, but the good news is that there are, uh, so there are several fairly robust user-friendly software packages, including open source R package Ergum, which I maintain, uh, that, is you, that can be used to estimate this in a reasonably robust and user-friendly manner. Right, uh, so what can we put in there? Well, we can put in to those models something like the density of the network, right? We can put in mixing matrices to model homophily or heterophily or whatever other kind of mixing patterns we have. And we can put in more than one mixing matrix at, a, at the same time. We can put in various degree distribution effects, how many individuals have no connections, how many individuals have one, how many have two and so on. We can put in clustering or triadic or various cycle effects, high order stuff. We can put in things like distance effects. So, you know, what is the uh, to, model, to model propinquity? Uh, and the nice thing about this framework is because we have that one exponential with the, the dot product, all the effects are estimated and reproduced jointly. So how do we interpret these models? Well, there's, there are two ways of interpreting. One is population level. In general, if you increase a particular element of theta, particular theta k, you will put more probability on networks with more of whatever g of k represents or gk represents. Right. So if you if theta k corresponds to the number of edges, then that'll uh, increase that. And uh, I almost think of it as having a number of dials, one for each network feature. And you turn the dial to increase that feature uh, or decrease that feature. It also it might also affect other features of the network, but you can adjust them down to get the configuration of features that you expect that you, that you want to see in expectation. There's also a diet level that is there's a low level interpretation as well. If we look at the probability of a relationship, given the rest of the network held fixed, right, because the relationships can't depend on each other, like a friend of a friend becomes a friend. But if a condition, it turns out that it kind of falls apart uh, into this form, which is like theta one times the change in the network feature due to changing that one relationship, ij, that we're looking at, uh, right, uh, ij. And uh, plus theta two, same thing, G2, same thing, plus all the others, which gives us something that, that actually resembles logistic regression. So we can, we can borrow a lot of what we understand about logistic regression uh, to understand ergons. Okay, so how do, we sam uh, how do we fit these? Well, again, there's, there's a whole separate thing, but um, I'm gonna focus on a particular kind of estimation from sampled network data, and particularly egocentric sampled network data, because that's the kind of data that is the easiest to get. So, in a perfect world, we would get some, we would see something like this, right? We would see a nice network in a Petri dish and uh, we would see everybody, how everybody relates to everybody and we can identify everybody. Of course, in real life, we don't often observe that. So this methodology was developed primarily in sexual partnership networks. Uh, again, uh, recall Sam Genesis talk, but uh, and there, you might not be able to identify a person and their, and their partners, but you might be able to get some information about their demographics. The person might tell you like, hey, I'm a red. I don't know whether you can see the mouse cursor here, but I'm a red and I have a connection with, the, with one blue. And I, I, we can't tell which red this is in the network or which blue or whether two of the reds are not talking to about the same blue, but we do have this big picture demographic level information. Right? Of course, we don't even get that. Usually, usually we get a sample of individuals of egos in the network. Uh, that's what's called an egocentric sample. Uh, but it turns out that we can actually get pretty far with that. Now, of course, there are other sampling methods, uh, including link tracing. Uh, they have their own challenges. 
which I won't get into. So the interesting thing about these models, now remember how I called these those G's sufficient statistics. Well, it turns out sufficient actually means something very important. And that's that we don't actually need to see the complete network to estimate the parameters of this model. We only need to see the sufficient statistics. And we can estimate those from the data. Now, how would we estimate them? Well, let's come back to this, our usual egocentric sample. Well, the, um, we have our sample and let's say we want to know how many red blue ties there are or blue red. Well, we count seven of them in the sample, but, but remember, but consider that every one of these relationships would get reported twice, once from each end if we asked everybody in the network, right? So we divide it with, we observe seven, we divide by two. Then we multiply by the sampling weight. That is, we had 20 in the population, 10 in the sample, and so our sampling weight is two. Now, uh, similarly, if you want to have red, red tie, uh, red, red, and blue, blue ties, or if you want to count the number of individuals who are isolated, who have no connections, uh, although here we don't divide by two, uh, because we don't uh, have double counting problem there and other degree distribution effects, right? So even without actually being able to see the network, we can get a pretty good idea of the big picture network features of the net of the sufficient statistics. So given those, that's all we need to get the estimate for the parameters. And in fact, we can even use various sampling machinery to uh, sampling theory machinery to quantify uncertainty. So here's the, the one application uh, that I'm going to illustrate this on. This was for racial disparities of HIV in the US. Uh, this is a picture of annual incidence uh, per 100,000 of uh, heterosexually acquired HIV infections. Right? And we can kind of see some patterns, right? We have differences, uh, big differences by race. And also within each race, women have higher rates of heterosexually acquired infections. So we set out to try to explain that, and we took data that are egocentric like that, that uh, you know, with demographic information about uh, individuals and their race and the partners in their race and miscellaneous other information. And we can fit a number of models. These are ergon fits, which uh, are fit on this very limited data that is uh, egocentric, but nationally representative. This is uh, US National Health and Social Life Survey, the references. Uh, at the top of the slide, and we can do things like test for the test and uh, represent the effect, uh, the tendency to have same sex ties versus opposite sex ties. Uh, you know, we can model activity by race, again, using whites as a baseline. We can see whether, uh, you know, there's a differential tendency to have ties. Uh, we can look at homophily, uh, yeah, typo there. Um, we can look at monogamy by sex and race, uh, which again is one of those uh, degree effects, right? And uh, we can simulate, right? So in particular, we can use that to validate the model. And in this case, none of the models we fit actually have the full degree distribution in them. And yet we can look, so we can look at how uh, the models recover the degree distribution with the parts of the model, of the th with the things that are in the model, right? Which is just monogamy. And it turns out that model three, which is the one with the monogamy, is the, one, is the only one that requires, covers the degree distribution. Right? So that's one way of validating the model. Uh, then we can also look at how we can then simulate and see how exposed different people are in the network. So in this case, this is the percent of individuals who are in a component of size greater than two. That is now component is basically uh, the set of people who can be reached through the network. So a component of size two is just two people who are each other's partners and nobody else's. Now, component of size greater than two, that means that one of the people has another partner, at least one. And uh, that means that the per, every, both people in the component are exposed by the network. And it turns out that once we control for differences in tendency towards monogamy, we actually see a pattern that's quite semblant of the one that we see with the observed incidents, right? So what this general approach lets us do is to use this very low order data, like this very, demographic level data to fit a model that incorporates only this demographic level data, does everything jointly, then through simulation, it lets us understand higher order network properties, right? So, and just as a brief postscript, uh, there are dynamic extensions for this. Uh, Sam Gines talked about them, so I won't get into them right now, except that uh, we might observe data like how long have two people been partners, right? So, you know, this particular red has been with this blue for two weeks. 
right? Or this blue with this red for four years. And that lets us add additional statistics, sufficient statistics to the model. Well, uh, again, I, I don't want to get into it in too much detail because uh, I'm pressed for uh, about eight minutes, I think, or four, six minutes. So uh, how does that relate to bipartite networks? Well, the thing is that so far we talked about HIV. HIV usually spreads person to person. Uh, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, uh, it can spread person to person directly, but it, also can, it can also spread from a person to a fomite to a person, or from a person to the air around the person to, a, to the person by sneezing or, and some such. Um, more generally, from a person to a venue to a person. Now, this work, before I continue, this work is joined with Tim Churches and others at the UNSW uh, Center for Brigade Research and Health. And uh, they've asked me to plug this website where they have a friendly user interface for um, using uh, what's called Shiny, or Shiny to uh, be able to uh, basically conveniently test various models for, uh, for COVID-19 spread. Okay, so bipartite networks, how would we, apply them here, how would we represent them? How would we represent these uh, people and venues? Well, let's say we have this network. This is what a bipartite network looks like. You have people, uh, several families and households, right? So that's actually one net bipartite network. And then you have uh, you know, people going to work or to school every day, and maybe the, the adults go to work, the children go to school, and one of the, some of the adults also go to school as, as employees. And we can represent them using a, what's called an incidence matrix, where just it's a one if, if a given person is in a given venue and zero otherwise. So this is for the houses, this is for the places of employment or education, right? Uh, what we can do with that is uh, something called, uh, we can take the, that bipartite network and actually look at it, uh, convert it to a person to person network, right? Where we can look by basically, what, by what is really a matrix multiplication or projection, uh, uh, where we can look at who is who, ha which pairs of people have potentially encountered each other in a venue where they might have contaminated each other or infected each other. Right. Uh, so we can. So if we have bipartite networks, we can uh, model that aspect of COVID nineteen spread. Okay. So how do we apply the, how do we apply Ergens to this? Well, it's actually quite straightforward because Ergens are ridiculously flexible. Uh, for starters, we can restrict relationships to those between person and venue, right, to make them work bipartite. Then uh, we, can have, we have attributes of person and attributes of a venue, and uh, we can combine those to have predictors for a person visiting a particular venue. Uh, the framework allows us to constrain the number of venues for a, uh, for a given person or number of people uh, for a given venue. And as before, estimation requires only sufficient statistics. So, uh, just to think about some things we might want to put into this model, and again, this is very preliminary work. Um, for a person, you might have their location, um, occupation, age. For a venue, you might have location, uh, type of, ve of venue, size of the venue in physical, physical area, and density of the venue in terms of how many people we'd expect in that venue for its size. Uh, and then given that, we can look at interactions and covariates, such as we take a person's location or residence and venue's location to get the geographic distance effect. Uh, we can look at uh, the, uh, or, and incidentally, if we look at a log of the geographic distance and put it in the model as a predictor, uh, we actually get a power law distance effect, which is again, the sort of thing that, uh, for example, uh, uh, Stephen talked about the other day. Uh, and, uh, uh, age, uh, so or similarly, we can look at age of a person or age category of person and type of venue uh, to get the tendency to go to that venue, uh, which is again a mixing matrix effect. And again, we can have any number of mixing matrices in the model at the same time. Uh, we can also look at different way capacities a person might visit, such as school as a teacher as a student or buy, shop as a buyer as a clerk. Lastly, and uh, I know I'm, I, I think I maybe need three more minutes. Is that okay? Okay. Um, Right, lastly, a bit on estimation, how would we get sufficient statistics for this? Well, let's say we have a bipartite network like this, and we also have some distances here, right, for, between a person and the, and the venue they go to. We don't get to see this network, right? Instead, we get to see something more like this. So here we have a report from a person who goes to work one kilometer away, and a child who goes to school half a kilometer away, and maybe a workspace that reports having two employees, 
right? And, but from that, we can already get quite a bit of information from this type of data, right? Because, because we know that there are five person to work uh, adult to uh, factory uh, connections. We know that there are, the, if we add up all the distances, we end up with six kilometers worth of travel. Uh, we end up, we can do the same with, with adults in schools. We can do the same with children attending schools and we can look at the distribution of the sizes of workplaces, right? Um, and then beyond that, uh, what we can do is we can uh, look at the, say the intensity of participation. So if we have a person venue link, we can look at, we can say control for the size of the venue to be, create weaker links there, uh, or maybe different capacities of people attending the venue. Uh, or maybe model link intensity, which is actually pretty straightforward because we're conditioning on the presence of the venue, which becomes a straightforward GLM. We can look at the interactions within the venue, such as a mixing of grades within school, workers in an office, uh, one or with, which actually just becomes a one mo a motor even within venue, and we can use, say, polymod to model that. And so what we're working on now is incorporating and actually getting the data put together to construct this kind of model and thinking about how to represent movements such as moving venues like buses, moving workplaces like cabs um, and scaling and getting this to scale computationally because the population of Australia is, tw is 25 million and there are over 13 million valid addresses in Australia. Uh, so that's basically what I have so far about this. Um, thank you all these people and uh, this, re this research is supported in part by all of these. Uh, entities and uh, in case you're, you're interested just for the sake of recording here's bibliography and I try to sort it so that if you, so you want to follow up on this uh, here's materials well that's uh, I think I'm well thank you all for uh, for coming to the talk thanks very much for sticking to time too Pavel we have uh, five minutes for questions um, who I don't have any in the chat as yet so would anyone like to ask a question or comment. Yes, yes I have a, a one question. I guess that you simulate this by MCMC to kind of reach yes. a stable distribution. Do mm -hmm. you consider the trajectory of the MCMC once it is stable as a dynamical version of this model? So that, that's a really good question because the, there is work uh, by I think Johan Koskinen, uh, who is uh, formerly at Manchester, now at Melbourne, uh, who uh, who has worked with this framework they call Lurgums or longitudinal Ergums, which sort of considered that. I I'm so I, I I haven't worked with that particular approach, and I'm a little bit skeptical about it for a number of reasons that uh, I'll be happy to talk about if you'd like, uh, but. It is in principle possible. Um, again, in practice, uh, we sort of, I, I prefer a somewhat different approach, which again, I think Sam Juness talked about it a bit uh, with, this, with Sturgums uh, in his talk. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, um. Uh, I had a general sort of question, Pavel, uh, that if you simulate networks in this sort of way, then you are going to get a network that uh, in some sense fits with the, the data you've put in, but can there be aspects you're missing, maybe difference between the, the overall thing being relatively closely geographically closely connected or being more spatially spread out i mean this is a problem that i think stephen riley was trying to address earlier in the week mm -hmm. yeah uh so there is nothing stopping you from putting in propinquity effects and again you can put them on various scales uh to get various strengths of propinquity effects um but as a more general uh, question yes uh it is important to check the goodness of it of the model uh, again, one way to do that is to look at, is essentially to consider, uh, to look at the features of the network that you did not explicitly put into the model and see if your model is able to reconstruct, reproduce them, which again, we did with the degree distribution. We only modeled uh, the number of indiv monogamous individuals, but we also got the number of, by, I guess, people with two partners, three partners, and so on uh, for free. 
right? So that's one way to do it. As another way to think about it is that um, and the one property that exponential family random graph models have, and this is a somewhat a technical term, is that they are what's called maximum entropy distributions. Um, and, they, and that means that basically, given the things that you actually put into the model, they are as random as they can be. So in some sense, you're kind of covering the range, you're covering the best possible range, or the biggest possible range of what could happen given what's in the model. And uh, in that, and in that sense, I think, uh, and again, they give you because they give you some notion of how much uncertainty there is. Uh, I think uh, that th that that helps. I mean, obviously, it doesn't solve all the problems. All models are wrong. Some are useful, but um, uh, I think, uh, but it, but the maximum entropy property does help. I think. Uh, John. You're muted. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Pavel. Um, just a question. Uh, if these are weighted networks, does everything go through just the same? Is, is it a, a trivial extension to apply these theories to weighted networks? Or, are there, or is there a whole other dimension of complications that we need to be aware of? Uh, yes and no. So I, I have a whole set separate books, have several papers and several packages and several, um, and, and some, and even some workshops on how using ergoms in a va for valued data, how to use ergoms for valued data. So the sampling and the inference machinery is unchanged. This is because ergoms have this property that everything reduces to the those summary statistics, right? But when you have a valued data, basically you have to make a lot more choices when specifying those statistics, right? Even like, for example, uh, how, do you, how do you define triad closure bias when you have counts of relations rather than just presence or absence, right? Uh, and there are also a few other things you need to specify. But I guess, uh, but the bottom line is that specifying the models can be more challenging. You have to think about more things, take more things into account, check for more problems, but the in, the inferential machinery stays is stays the same and transfers directly, and uh, we do. And the packages that I've mentioned, well, the Ergon package has extensions for valued uh, network data, although we don't have user-friendly interface for fitting Eurocentric data to it yet. If if somebody wants to work work on that, I, I'm happy to collaborate. By the way. Um, what would I know if I was doing it wrongly? I'm, I'm thinking of ecological networks which I've worked on in the past okay. and we would just have a load of numbers in a matrix and randomize them because that was the game that people were playing in those days um, yeah. and we would sorry like quap qap I... oh, oh never mind okay, okay. um and it, it took a lot of stare a lot it took a lot of mistakes a lot of staring to realize that there was a really simple structure within these networks which we were completely ignoring in all of our off-the-shelf randomization schemes and it just took actually very simple maths and, and staring at mistakes for ages to make it work. But I was wondering if, if there are warning signs for when, you, for when your ergum is misrepresenting your data. There, there are several. One is actually that it doesn't fit, that the, the model estimation algorithm doesn't converge. So uh, there is a whole long history which you might have heard of uh, called, uh, with ergum degeneracy uh, I, I'm, I suspect that's a word that people have heard around organs. And uh, there's a lot of history there, which uh, again, I don't think is, this is a good use of time to go through. Uh, but uh, one symptom is that trying to use MCMC to fit the model uh, doesn't work. Uh, but more generally, again, I think the easiest thing to do is, is well, actually the easiest thing to do is actually just to just look at the AICs and the BICs and all those things. Uh, and then, you know, if one model is, has, is better in that respect than another, then probably the other model doesn't fit as well. Uh, there's also a paper by uh, Hunter et al. 2008 in the uh, Journal of American Statistical Association, uh, which talks about how to basically simulate network features not in the model and then look at how um, and how they match the observed network features and, and uh, thus get some idea of lack of fit. Um, 
this is actually, uh, one can also use that, by the way, to test for various uh, additional effects in the model uh, that you don't necessarily want to put into the model, but that's a whole separate, again, that's a whole separate conversation. The thing is, uh, the, the, the exponential family framework uh, is, in some ways, it's, it's, it can be hard, it's challenging to specify and fit, but it's also quite amazing because you basically get a lot of stuff for free. Uh, and I get it. So, so I, I know this is probably a broader answer than what you were looking for, but uh, it is where it is. I think we should probably move on to the next speaker. We're a couple of minutes over and uh, we have plenty of time for general discussion later on. So if you have other questions for Pavel, save them up for all that occur, you can ask them later. Uh, I hope Pavel will stay with us. Um, okay, so, so thank you very much for that.